it just so happens that we're very blessed in New York to have uh, one of the you know, preeminent specialists on enzymes and cancer in the world. And uh, so I'm super excited that uh, we are able to welcome uh, to speak today Dr. Nicholas Gonzalez. Okay, well, thank you for having me. Of course, in 10 minutes, I can't give the history of my 27 years of practice and my five years of research before then, but I'll try. First, I'll just give a brief history of what we do. In our office, as many of you know, we offer a very intensive nutritional approach to cancer and other degenerative diseases like multiple sclerosis, chronic Lyme, neurological Lyme, chronic fatigue, ALS, MS, autoimmune diseases like Sjogren's syndrome. Our program involves three basic components, individualized diet, individualized supplement programs with, for cancer patients, large doses of pancreatic enzymes, and also the third component, detoxification routines. Now, in terms of diet, we don't have one magical diet. We have 10 basic diets that range from largely plant-based, of course, all organic whole foods, to an Atkins-type red meat diet with a lot of fat. And we have dozens of variations of the diet, and we prescribe the diet depending on the patient's metabolic needs. Secondly, we're famous for prescribing large doses of supplements. My average cancer patient takes about 200 capsules a day. They include specially designed vitamins, minerals, trace elements, and also glandular products from organically raised animals. All our glandular and enzyme products come from New Zealand, which never had mad cow as the cleanest environment on earth. These include things like extracts of liver and pancreas, heart, and these things are very essential. Now the third component, which is often the most controversial, and even within the alternative world traditionally was often overlooked as detoxification, although in recent years I will say it's become more commonly prescribed by alternative <coughs> practitioners. And these are simple techniques like the infamous coffee enemas that ironically and paradoxically come right out of the conventional medical literature that we find help the liver and the kidney work more efficiently. As the body repairs and rebuilds, the normal tissues are going to release a lot of toxic debris like heavy metals, pesticides, hydrocarbons, you know, there are over 79,000 chemicals being released in the environment. A lot of these chemicals and products get stored in our cells on our program. The cells start releasing them, they do house cleaning, dump those, these toxins into the bloodstream, they're filtered in the liver, in the kidney. Also, there's nothing more toxic to the human body than dead tumor waste. Oncologists recognize that. Although chemotherapy doesn't work for most cancers, it does work for some, and for many it can reduce tumors, though not long term. If an oncologist learned a long time ago, if they kill a tumor too fast, the patient will die from tumor lysis syndrome, which is simply liver and kidney failure due to the overproduction and the too rapid production of dead tumor waste. That happens in our program too, so we have procedures like coffee enemas. Now, oddly enough, when you drink coffee, it suppresses the liver. When you take it rectally, it stimulates the sacral parasympathetics that will, will through a reflex, spinal reflex, stimulate both phase one and phase two detoxification systems in the liver. They're absolutely critical. You can't do our therapy without doing detoxification routines. We also have procedures like liver flushes and fast, juice fast, and, and um, colon cleansers. Now, what I thought I'd do is present a case, because in 10 minutes, I don't have a lot of time. A few years ago, I gave a seven-hour lecture in London, and the next day I spoke for two hours, because I don't have that kind of time. But I'll try and sum it up in one memorable case. I, I'm currently in the process of doing what it may turn out to be, it sounds megalomaniacal, three volumes, 150 cases. 120 of them will be cancer. I've been in practice 27 years. We have patients who've been with us 27 years, but also other things like chronic fatigue, lupus, scleroderma. This is a wonderful patient. He had pancreatic cancer. He was a young man when he was diagnosed. He's a lawyer from St. Louis in real estate development, very successful. He was a single father with two young kids, and his life couldn't have been going better. His, his work was going well. He was very successful in what he did. He loved his two kids. They were doing well. He starts getting reflux. This is in the fall of 2000, over 14 years ago. He starts developing reflux. He was followed by an internist at Barnes Hospital, which one was the, is one of the great teaching hospitals at Washington University. They did an upper GI series, and they said, well, you've got esophageal reflux disease. So they bring him to surgery in January 2001, 14 years ago, almost to the day. The surgeon opens him up, and to his horror and astonishment, his liver is loaded with cancer. And I have a, a, a quote from the operative note, quote, the doctor discovered, quote, multiple umbilicated white, firm, and gritty tumors in both the right and left lobes of the liver, apparently occupying approximately 50% of the volume of the liver. This is an extraordinary amount of cancer, as all the physicians in this room know. 
The liver lesion was, a liver lesion was biopsied. It came back, quote, positive for malignancy, fa favored metastatic adenocarcinoma. Now, they hadn't done CAT scans before surgery. After surgery, they did a complete metastatic workup. CAT scan of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis revealed a large 6.5 by 3.7 center mass in the tail of pancreas with, quote, diffuse hepatic metastases, end quote. The radi radiologist wrote, quote, this likely represents primary pancreatic adenocarcinoma, end quote. After but was done, he was referred to an oncologist at Barnes Hospital who admitted right away that he could not cure him, be able to get a response. Now about 30 to 40 percent of pancreatic cancer patients will respond to chemo. Unfortunately and tragically, the responses don't last invariably. The cancer comes back more aggressively. One of the problems with chemo is it always selects for a more aggressive clone, so you get these remarkable reductions in tumor, and then to the great astonishment of the oncologist, it comes back more aggressive, and with a situation like that, patients invariably are dead within three to six months. The oncologist suggests, because he's a single father with two kids, that at least maybe he could give him maybe two years. Thirty to forty percent of patients, he explained, do respond. He might last that long, probably not longer. He suggested the drug, drug cisplatinum and ectopicide. The patient decided he was going to go to Sloan Kettering, get a second opinion, go to Mecca, comes to New York and sees Dr. Eileen O'Reilly, the famed pancreatic specialist at Sloan, who happens to hate alternative medicine. He was seen, he was seen by Dr. O'Reilly in late January 2001, and this is from Dr. O'Reilly's note from Sloan Kettering, the, quote, the patient has significant fatigue, takes naps usually by the end of the afternoon. As an aside, he was starting to deteriorate clinically, as happens with metastatic stage four pancreatic cancer. He does note, note recent onset back pain, which is alleviated with pain pills. He has significant nausea without vomiting. He does have occasional palpitations. He notes mildly decreased appetite and has approximately a 10-pound weight loss. Dr. O'Reilly repeated what the Barnes Hospital oncologist said, we can't cure you, you might respond. And she actually suggested the same regimen, etoposide and, and cisplatin, which is sometimes used with pancreatic cancer. So he decides to go back to Barnes and do the therapy. So he starts therapy in February 2001, and after the first cycle of chemo, his oncologist does a CAT scan to see what's going on. And it does show some reduction. Remember, 30 to 40 percent of patients with stage 4 pancreatic cancer will have an initial reduction in tumor volume from chemo. As to the pr this is from the radiology note from the CAT scan done in February 2001. As the, as on the prior examination, there is a low attenuation mass within the tail of the pancreas. The mass is smaller in size, measuring 6.4 by 3.0 centimeters. It's still a very big tumor. By pancreatic cancer standards, anything bigger than 2.5 centimeters is considered quite large. On, on today's study, there are innumerable low atten attenuation lesions throughout the liver, measuring up to 2 centimeters in diameter, consistent with metastatic disease. Oncologist gives him a second cycle of chemo and then decides to repeat the CAT scan. These were the glory days for radiology when CAT scans were being done almost every month on patients like this, which is absolute craziness. By the 1990s, there were already, st already studies out of Germany showing a single CAT scan can give you up to 1,000 chest x-rays worth of radiation. A PET scan can give you up to 1,400 chest x-rays worth of radiation. CAT scans not only are carcinogenic in of themselves, but can make existing cancer grow faster. The archives of internal medicine articles from the mid 2000s showed that up to 29,600 cases of cancer in the U.S. are being caused by CAT and PET scans. But in those days, oncologists were still very cavalier about overordering CAT scans. So after the second cycle of chemo, we get another CAT scan, and again it showed marked improvement in the numerous liver metastases and a decreased size of the pancreatic tail mass. But it wasn't cured, but there was reduction, which the oncologist suggested might happen. He goes for his third cycle of chemotherapy, and then he almost dies. At that point, he, he weighs the risks and benefits, decides he's not going to proceed with chemo, starts looking into alternatives, learned about our work, and decides he's going to see us. He realized if he continued chemo, he probably would die. He ended up in the emergency room almost dead from the chemo. Stops chemo. We tried to rush him in. I saw him in May 2001, and the first thing that I noticed about this fellow is he's facing stage 4 cancer, which is a death sentence. And he was a lawyer, a very smart man, very successful in business. But he was calm as could be, and he had gotten over the fear. Now, the, we take credit, and yes, our enzymes are wonderful, and the use of pancreatic enzymes goes back to 1902 with Dr. Beard's work at the University of Edinburgh, and yes, we believe the science behind the use of enzymes is wonderful, but the single most important determinant in how a patient does is their attitude. If they have a negative attitude, if family members are instilling doubt and hostility, if they have lack of faith in the treatment they're going to pursue, they're not going to do well. We've become very good because we've made mistakes in the past about selecting those patients out. And I will put them in a cab up to go to Sloan Kettering, and I'll pay for the cab ride to get them out of my office. Hostile, angry people, 
they're not going to get well. People with doubts who say, if this is so good, why is it in the Sloan County? If this is so good, why is the American Medical Association not adopted? They don't belong in your office. The single most important determinant is the faith and the attitude of the patient. He had absolute faith. I don't know why. I don't know why some patients will read about us and have faith and others say, well, this is any good. Why isn't the American Cancer Society embracing it? Absolute faith, wasn't on the internet, didn't want to know about 15 other treatments, didn't come in with a list of things. Should I go to Italy? Should I go to Spain to get treatment? Should I go to Mexico? He just wanted to do my therapy. Those are the patients that do well. We're not running a cult, but we find that kind of attitude, determination, and single-minded faith always leads to good success. Starts the program, does it well. I wasn't as aggressive about doing CAT scans. Ten months into this, he asked if he could have a CAT scan done. I gave him my little lecture about the overuse of radiation. He agrees to do it, and th this is February 2002. He'd been in my treatment 10, 10 months. And this shows multiple tiny lesions in the liver, all less than three millimeters in size, much smaller. No pancreatic lesion. I'm reading from the radiology report. No abdominal pelvic lesion. The pancreatic lesion was gone. That's good news. He continues on his therapy 17 months after starting. We repeat the CAT scan at his request. No pancreatic lesion identified. Multiple tiny lesions in the liver seen in the prior examination are not identified in today's study, completely gone. He had follow-up scans in March 2003, June 2004, March 2005, and one in 2009, which show the liver, gallbladder, pancreas, spleen, both kidneys appear unremarkable. He's alive and well, no evidence of disease, <coughs> total regression just on our treatment. And he's done really well. Now, how did we treat him? Do I still have time here? Yeah, I do. Um, <laughs> well, first, his diet, all old, respect to Dr. Seyfried, who thinks all cancer patients need to be on a ketogenic Atkins type high fat diet. He's on a high carbohydrate diet. He has been for 14 years, 70% carbohydrates. We, we did allow fish, eggs, yogurt initially, no red meat, no poultry, everything organic, everything whole, of course. Lots of fruit, as much fruit as he wanted, all the grains that he wanted. Yeah, grains are the enemy of mankind. Well, in the Old Testament, grains, of course, were a sacred food. And I figured if grains are good enough for God at the temple worship, they're good enough for me, so he's on grains. Yeah, we have patients, we call them our Eskimo patients, that need to be on nothing but fat and meat, and they don't eat grains. So he's done really well on that. Four glasses of carrot juice a day, loaded with natural sugar. No, it didn't make his cancer grow. It helped it go away. Large doses of carbs, minimal amounts of uh, fat, animal fat, some protein. In terms of supplements, he did well with beta carotene, thiamine, riboflavin, niacin, pyridoxin, folic acid, large doses of C, by large doses, eight to 10 grams. D, we use moderate doses with him two to 4,000 units a day, minimal doses of E. Gerson wrote about patients on E whose tumors grow. He was one of those patients. We use minimal doses. No calcium. This is a patient that will do terribly with calcium, but thrives on magnesium. We had him on about 1,000 milligrams of magnesium, about 300 milligrams of potassium. Magnesium potassium for epithelial solid tumors is a lifesaver. Calcium can kill him. Manganese, chromium, very little zinc and selenium, which we find counterproductive. And in terms of the fatty acids, we use flaxseed oil with him, which has the linoleic acid and alpha acid in the ratios and doses that we like. And on this therapy, he did, he, with those supplements, he did well. In terms of pancreatic enzymes, we, ha we had him on about, a thou about 100 capsules a day, um, about 45,000 grams of pancreatic enzymes a day, and six doses spread through the day, both with and away from meals. Dr. Beard in 1902 first presented this thesis that pancreatic proteolytic enzymes have an anti-cancer effect in both clinical work and in animal studies. He proved his point, wrote a brilliant book in 1911, The Enzyme Treatment of Cancer, that should have changed the course of medicine, mentioned it before. We have reprinted it as a facsimile of the original version. It never was reprinted. Unfortunately, again, Beard, when he died in 1924, died in obscurity, and his work has been kept alive just serendipitously by people on the fringes of medicine keeping his wonderful work alive. <clears throat> and I believe 100 years ago, he had the solution to cancer through the pancreatic enzyme treatment. We had him on a huge dose of pancreatic enzymes and the detoxification routines, which my conventional colleagues, who get interested in our work, always laugh at. But ironically, and I always seem surprised when I tell them that the coffee enemas come right out of the conventional nursing and medical textbooks. And they, they're absolutely critical because our patients, <coughs> like conventional patients, will go through tumor lysis syndrome. They can become auto-intoxicated. They do need extraordinary measures to help the liver and the kidney function as the tumor breaks down quickly and coffee enemas do this. I wish more oncologists would be get interested in this, get over their fear of coffee taking rectally. It's in the medical literature, and oncologists will also give pain medicine rectally, so there's nothing sacred about avoiding medication rectally. So 
coffee enemas will work, will help patients, do help them get through the tumor lysis syndrome. So on, that di on this program, the individualized diet, in his case, a high carbohydrate diet, sorry, Dr. Seyfried, large doses of enzymes, the individualized supplement program, the detoxification routines, he's alive and well 14 years later. To put him in perspective, I was trained as an academician. I was trained to do bone marrow transplants. I like to read the medical literature for fun, as my wife who's sitting there will say on a Friday night, that's what I'm doing, reading medical journals, to, to her dismay often. Um, I've, never, I've never been able to document a case like this, equivalent to this, a 14-year survivor, stage 4 pancreatic cancer, biopsy-proven liver metastases confirmed at two major academic institutions, including Sloan Kettering and Barnes Hospital at Washington University, who 14 years later is totally disease-free, alive with total regression of disease. And these are the kind of cases that we're putting into our book. Now, James said, you know, one of the things that people say about alternative medicine, where's the science? And I say, well, if you don't look for it, you're not going to find it. If you don't look east, you're not going to see the sunrise. If you don't go to the library and look up Dr. Beard, who published dozens of patients in the conventional peer-reviewed mainstream medical literature, if you don't look for it, you're not going to find it. So if you keep your head buried in the sand, you won't do this. Anybody at any any medical center can access his papers. I was able to do it. There's no magic about how I learned this. I went to the medical literature. I went to the scientific literature and learned about enzymes, learned about beer, and learned about coffee enemas. And I think I've used up my 10 minutes. <laughs> so, okay.